There's a spectrum to gender, people say. The very existence of people born with different chromosomal configurations or ambiguous genitalia proves that. In this video, I'm Dr. Christopher West, the Theology of the Body Guy. I will offer a Catholic response. Let's take a look. We continue our series looking at questions in my book, The Good News About Sex and Marriage. If you're interested in following along and having your own copy, check out the link in the notes below. Here's what I want to say right off the bat. Catholic teaching on gender is based on the blueprint of our humanity, which is found in the beginning, to quote Christ. In the beginning. Haven't you read, Jesus says, that in the beginning, God made them male and female. The world we live in now is a fallen world. Something has gone wrong with the world in which we live. Tragically, as I say here, because of the mystery of humanity's fall into sin, painful anomalies have been introduced into creation that were never part of God's perfect, loving design. He allows them, obviously, but he does not will them. For example, we know that human beings are meant to have arms and legs, but we also know that in this fallen world in which we live, sometimes people are born without arms and legs. We also know that people are meant to be able to see, to hear, to speak, but sometimes people in this fallen world are born blind, deaf, or unable to speak. It's tragic when birth defects like this occur precisely because something has gone wrong. And we know something has gone wrong because there is a blueprint for human nature against which we can judge when something has gone wrong. Now, in these cases of birth defects, it's important to recognize that the person's physical development departed from the natural order of things. It did not change the natural order of things. We still know people are meant to have arms and legs, even if, sadly, some people are born without them. It's the same in those rare cases of those who are born with chromosomal disorders or ambiguous genitalia. Disorders of sexual development do not alter the reality of human nature. It remains true that we are meant to be and are designed by God to be one sex or the other, even if anomalies are sometimes introduced to our fallen world and make it unclear to which sex a person belongs. Now, here's also a very important point we must insist on. While birth defects are attributable to the mystery of sin in a general sense, original sin, right? This does not mean that they are immediately attributable to that person's sinfulness. Remember the scene in the Gospels when a blind man is brought before Jesus and they say, why did this happen? Is it because of his sin or his parents' sin? Listen to what Jesus says here. So important for us. Jesus says, neither he nor his parents sinned to cause this. Rather, he was born blind, Jesus says, so that the works of God might be made visible through him. This is God's promise to us. Whatever evils we may suffer in this life, God is going to bring about a greater glory. And we can certainly say what Jesus said of the blind man. We can certainly say the same about other birth defects, including those rare cases of ambiguous genitalia or chromosomal disorders. God has a plan yet to be fully revealed in us for bringing great good out of all of the suffering that he allows in our lives. And with our faith firmly placed there, I quote St. Paul, we can consider that the sufferings of this present time are as nothing compared with the glory to be revealed in us. Medical science can almost always determine the true sex of a child when it is unclear, and surgical intervention is legitimate in the case of correcting actual birth defects. But even in those rare cases when science cannot be certain about the sex of a child, God knows that person's true sexual identity and it will be fully revealed in the resurrection of the body. My brothers and sisters, if we place our faith in happiness only coming to us in this world, then we will be woefully disappointed. 
Our happiness is promised in the next world. And in this life, even our sufferings become a path to that happiness. This is why Paul says our sufferings are as nothing compared to the glory, the happiness, the joy that awaits us on the other side. Now, of course, there are many things we can do in this life to make this world a better place. But this has to be done with a humble recognition of God's plan, of God's order. And there are certain things that in the end we can't fix that in the end, only God can resolve. And we must be patient enough to wait for such resolutions in the next life. If we hope only for happiness in this world, St. Paul tells us we are the most pitiable of all people. The Lord has promised to those who trust in his mercy that in the next world, every last ounce of evil, sorrow, and suffering will be fully redeemed. Then the eyes of the blind shall see, Scripture promises, and the ears of the deaf be opened. Then the lame shall leap like a stag, and the mute tongue will sing for joy. And we can certainly add that those who in this life were born with chromosomal disorders or ambiguous genitalia, in the next life, if they have said yes to the gift of God's redemption, they will be raised and live forever in the full glory of their male or female identity that God has always known is at the root of who they really are. This is the promise of God himself to those who trust in his love. In this fully redeemed, resurrected state, I conclude here, we will know for certain that God permitted suffering and evil in this world and in our own lives, says the Catechism, I quote here, only as occasions and means for displaying all the power of his arm and the whole measure of the love he wanted to give the world. The fact that God allows evil is a mystery. He doesn't promise that he will remove our sufferings in this life, but he promises he will be with us in those sufferings. John Paul II once said that if Christ had not borne our sufferings on the cross, the idea that God is love would be unfounded. Know that whatever your sufferings are, you are not alone in them. And the promise of the one who suffers with you Christ himself is that your sufferings and my sufferings will be turned into glory. That's why I'm Catholic, because the Catholic Church is the place, you might say, where Christ has promised that all our sufferings will be transformed into joy. If that's real, I want to be part of it, and I imagine you do too. I have so much more to share with you about God's plan for our lives, and I do so in the courses I teach for the Theology of the Body Institute. I encourage you to check out the link below to learn more. Until next time, may our eyes continue to be opened ever more fully to the glory of God revealed through our bodies.